I do have a comment from Craig Wallace, uh, who is a leading spokesman for people with disability Australia and who um, has very importantly undertaken a major campaign against the impact that COVID and the policies of the, of the Australian government has had on disabled people that he rightly refers to as social murder um, of, of our people. And he has uh, uh, tweeted the, uh, the advertisement for our meeting tonight and has, uh, in response to uh, Comrade Dave's comment that the ruling class is at war with, uh, with its population, he said that uh, greetings from Canberra, which of course is Parliament House, we, meaning the political um, establishment, are also in a war against disabled people and older people. He says solidarity from disabled people who are at the front line, uh, this is social murder of our people. And uh, he, he's very appreciative of uh, the, the contributions of uh, both our comrades. Uh, there is a question um, that has come from um, uh, Morgan in Melbourne, who asks David whether he could describe the genesis of this book. When did he first think it necessary to produce the book? What were the specific conditions which underlay this decision? So possibly we could start with that. Um, well, the genesis, as I was trying to explain in my opening remarks, uh, it was in the autumn of 1982. Uh, very serious uh, problems had emerged within the International Committee. I mean, the Workers' Revolutionary Party in Britain was veering ever more openly away from foundational programmatic conceptions of uh, the Fourth International. And the struggle that uh, had led uh, to the founding of the International Committee itself in 1953 and the op opposition of the International Committee to the reunification with Pablism in 1963, there was an abandonment to sum up really of the theory of permanent revolution and adaptation uh, to various bourgeois national regimes, to the labor bureaucracies. And all of this was uh, covered over, first of all, with a denigration of his historical significance and the promotion of something which was called the practice of cognition, essentially a form of crude pragmatism, which dismissed the significance and centrality of the great historical experiences out of which the Fourth International emerged. <clears throat> the argument was that the education of Cater was not on the basis of these experiences, but on uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, a mystified dialectical method which supposedly provided a master key or which uh, obviated the necessity of studying anything. Clearly, it had nothing to do with uh, dialectics as it would have been understood by Lenin and, and Trotsky. And so in the course of writing this, <clears throat> uh, as I said before, the in answering the question, how did Tom Henehan become a cater? How are Cater trained in the socialist movement? Uh, I began a recapitulation of the major experiences of the Trotskyist movement, the central role played by Trotsky himself. And the basic argument was that the assimilation of the lessons of these experiences are the foundation of the development of Marxist Cater. And uh, only within that context can one understand what dialectical materialism 
is. What This is not a mystical method. It is, in essence, one might say, a historically informed approach to the development of the class struggle on an international scale. And the essential uh, lessons of that struggle are drawn from the systematic study of the history of the Trotskyist movement. And uh, within that context, I set out to demonstrate uh, Trotsky's very conscious uh, utilization of the dialectical method uh, in his analysis of such phenomena as, well, of course, the Soviet bureaucracy, in his uh, study of the contradictions of capitalism, uh, I demonstrated that he was, of course, the greatest master of dialectics uh, in the modern historical period. I said he was one of these writers where, you know, you, in great art, you don't see the seams. You don't see the work. It's there. Uh, he was, uh, I made the point that he was a, he was such a great writer that one tends at times to take for granted the profound his, uh, theoretical content of his writing. And now I was answering Jerry Healy, uh, the leaders of the WRP, and uh, actually hoping in the writings of these essays uh, that it would encourage a re-examination and discussion of the uh, errors which were being made in the International Committee. Uh, that was not the result. In fact, uh, they refused to discuss anything. And uh, in the course of the next uh, year and two years, it became increasingly evident uh, that uh, this was an organization which was systematically breaking with every principle, and it finally uh, led to an open uh, struggle and a reorganization of uh, the majority of the International Committee, including, of course, its Australian section on a generally Trotskyist foundation. So, you know, as I said, books have, a, have their own fate. I could not have imagined uh, in 1982 when the writing began that ultimately this book would have such significance in the struggle which developed within the International Committee and in the education of the movement. And I must say, yeah, as a writer, it's and as a revolutionist, uh, you know, one goes back and rereads something one wrote many, many decades ago. And, uh, and one has to study it oneself. You know, it's something which I think when one, you know, in serious writing, you have to somehow raise yourself above yourself and try to work and think systematically, which is hard to do. Um, but going back over it, um, I think it stands the test of time. And certainly when I read it today, and I hope, and I believe that's the response of Cater within our movement, uh, they don't look at the book and say, well, that was off, or, yeah, well, you know. No, I think it really holds together, and it certainly... Uh, there is a continuity between the last articles and the first articles. And the basic conception of Trotsky's relationship to Marxism, Trotsky's role in world history, uh, has been substantiated. Again, remember when this was first written in 1982, the Soviet Union still existed. The communist parties were all mass parties. Uh, Healy himself had begun to refer to the Trotskyists as Trotskyite grupos. You know, he was speaking of his own organization with contempt. And yet within a very short period of time, all of these great so-called mass organizations and real existing socialism would prove to be nothing. Or to utilize the great Hegelian formulation all that exists deserves to perish. In other words, <clears throat> the uh, Stalinist bureaucracy, for all its apparent reality, had become unreal and was doomed. And the Trotskyist movement, however small it was, because it represented the 
accurately the logic of the historical process, uh, it prevailed. And one can say today, there is not another movement in the world outside of our own that can make with any credibility the claim to represent revolutionary Marxism. I just listening to Carmen Evans' remarks. We've passed through, and we are still in the midst of a staggering global crisis. This is the greatest public health crisis in world history. One would imagine that the bookstores of the world would be packed with volumes on COVID. One would imagine that the Nobel Prize in medicine and chemistry would have gone to those, not to mention the rather dubious Nobel Peace Prize, would have gone to campaigners and scientists and doctors who were in the forefront of the fight against this scourge. One would imagine that political parties were outdoing themselves in order to present themselves as fighters with programs which address the pandemic. Nothing of the sort. The number of articles which have been produced by all so-called left organizations over the last three years, if you added them up, they would not equal the number of articles produced on the World Socialist website in any two or three months. Again, the most difficult challenge which we faced in putting this volume together, and it was in itself a Herculean task, was selecting out of the thousands of articles produced even in the first year, a representative sample. And that massive work will continue. We are following this virus, its development, the political and social questions. Now, the point is, how can one explain that we were the only ones who did it? I would add to this list, has there been a single movie anywhere that has addressed this? I mean, one thinks about a social crisis. Just in America, a million people have died. Worldwide, millions. Well, we know the reverberating impact of every human death. Yeah. What was the famous poem by Dryzen, Dry, uh, by Dunn? Every man's death diminishes me, for I am in love with mankind. Therefore, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Well, apply that truth. We all are diminished by the loss of every human life. How many children have lost their grandparents? I'm at an age where I appreciate the significance of grandparenthood. And I know how important it was in my life. Over 10, and how many children have been orphaned? Coming over uh, to Australia, I was speaking to uh, a flight attendant who asked me about the uh, mask I was wearing. And she told me she had been sick three times. She's lost friends. Pilots who have died. And I hate to you know, be morbid about it, but how many people in critical uh, professions which require a tremendous level of daily attention have had their capacities diminished in one form or another by a disease, which is a multi-organ disease. I mean, this, this scourge has had vast social, economic, and I might add psychological consequences. And yet the bourgeoisie is incapable and unwilling to deal with any of it. And I must add finally, this book is unique. COVID capitalism and class war. It has not, let us see where it is reviewed. And in fact, such is the level of intimidation. And I'm not going to mention names out of respect for the privacy and also an appreciation of the terrible pressures individuals have been working under. 
I mean, those who have spoken out face ostracism, persecution, and even prosecution. Uh, yes, uh, bourgeois society, bourgeois regimes are at war with their people. And I'll make just one last point. The indifference to uh, nuclear war, which we now see in every government, has been conditioned and prepared by the indifference to mass death. They don't give a damn. That's the horrible, horrible truth. Thank you uh, for those those remarks, which I think were, were very helpful. We do have other questions uh, that have come in. One is from uh, Philip in Melbourne, who asks, Evan, could you explain more about the purpose and role of the World Socialist website Global Inquest into COVID? Yeah, no, I can make a number of points on that. Um, just initially, I would you know, note that we launched the inquest in uh, November, 2021, uh, just four days before news broke that the Omicron variant was rapidly spreading in South Africa. And really, I think uh, we had a number of discussions uh, in the lead up to publishing the statement announcing the inquest and really it flowed out of the the work that we did in uh, 2021, uh, in particular, the WSWS uh, hosted two major webinars on the pandemic in August and October, and uh, which brought together uh, scientists, uh, workers from throughout the world, uh, really, you know, centered on explaining uh, what had to be done to to bring an end to the pandemic. Um, and I would just note, sort of going off of uh, what Dave was just saying, I think really. Uh, the work that we've done with scientists throughout the pandemic has been essential. Uh, we've, you know, uh, every day we have discussions on the international editorial board about the state of the pandemic, uh, what the developments are, and you know we follow uh, the scientific literature uh, on social media, in particular on on Twitter, uh, and the uh, the work that uh, scientists have done there has been. Um, just immens immensely significant. And so over the course of 2021, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Mateus, who's our lead writer on the pandemic, uh, began to interview uh, a number of scientists, uh, Yanir Baryam, uh, Eric Feigelding, Jose Luis Jimenez, uh, and, and many others who have played really uh, critical roles uh, throughout the pandemic. And so then in August, we hosted this, uh, this webinar which uh, after we, we published a statement really outlining the, uh, the potential and necessity uh, to eliminate uh, COVID, to eradicate COVID uh, and you know, eliminate it throughout the world, uh, stop all human to human transmission of the virus, which was at that point, uh, China had already uh, had a zero COVID policy in place for over a year. Uh, they had had, um, I don't know, the, I forget the precise number, but I think I believe it was less than 10 deaths basically from uh, May until that point. Um, actually, I think it was even less. I think it was less than five. Uh, New Zealand had eliminated COVID, uh, Vietnam, many other countries. And um, there was a major uh, paper that was put out by uh, Michael Baker, uh, basically arguing that it was possible to eradicate COVID. And we recognize really that the um, the science was absolutely clear uh, that this was possible, uh, but the what was fundamentally lacking was an understanding of this science within the, within the working class and, and an understanding of the the uh, really the the uh, political uh, significance of the pandemic and uh, you know what um, really the the crimes that had been committed. And so we uh, after these these. Uh, these webinars, um, you know, we decided that we would initiate uh, our own independent investigation, really with the fundamental aim of uh, educating the working class. And I think that uh, has really been central to uh, all of our work on the pandemic. And um, so I guess th that would be the main point that I would make, but just, uh, you know, as the statement announcing the inquest outlines 
uh, really, you know, the pandemic amounts to a monumental uh, social crime, uh, which has been committed uh, by governments throughout the world. Uh, you know, in particular, uh, the policies of, of herd immunity, uh, you know, by that point, uh, or at that point in the pandemic in November 2021, uh, there were many governments which were uh, not, which had not um, basically embraced this uh, this strategy of, of herd immunity. And uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going off on a bit, but uh, basically, you know, we um, we really recognized that uh, there was this profound need for uh, the working class to to draw the lessons from the pandemic. And so that's been the sort of the central aim of the inquest. Uh, we've interviewed uh, scientists, uh, experts. Um, you know, uh, one of the first interviews that we did was with uh, Nicholas Smith, where he comprehensively uh, exposed the, the policies regarding masking uh, and airborne transmission. Uh, one shortly after that was with Jose Luis Jimenez, which really, I think, you know, comprehensively indicted the role of the World Health Organization, the CDC, and other uh, public health agencies for their um, really refusal to educate society on airborne transmission. Uh, and then we've had dozens of interviews with workers and anti-COVID activists uh, from throughout the world, uh, in particular, many uh, patients uh, suffering from long COVID. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it's been very significant. Uh, there's also another uh, significant entry on the uh, the policies of specific governments, the policies that have been implemented in uh, Brazil, uh, in uh, in Sweden, uh, and the exporting of the herd immunity strategy globally. Uh, and another early testimony, which was critical, was from a scientist on the uh, zero COVID policy in China, which basically refuted or um, you know exposed all of the the propaganda and lies that had been spread about that policy by uh, Western governments, in particular. Um, so those are the, the main points that I would stress. Uh, thanks, Evan. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, we do have a, a, another important question in from uh, Craig Wallace uh, from People with Disabilities Australia, and um, he asks, uh, and I think this is this is quite central to uh, the coverage on the, the WSWS and, and the book. Um, he asks, have you looked at the financial interests which are served by reducing the numbers of disabled and older people through COVID in reducing costs to the NDIS, that, that's disability care and aged care and social assistance. Um, he asks, are we seeing successive zoonotic plague events being opportunistically weaponized to produce eugenic outcomes? Um, and he, he adds this comment, I, I think, um, he says, uh, this time, human carnage works for them, thins the herd, cuts costs, and makes people lead into fascism. There is incredible pressure to remain silent, but some of us have nothing to lose. Um I think that's a very, you know, a very powerful statement, and certainly one that goes to the heart to uh, a number of a number of the, the statements in this book, um, which is, uh, you know, as as we've as you've been outlining. I mean, this this is a um, the, the means for, to combat the pandemic were very well known from the very beginning. Um, the science was not a mystery at all. Uh, in fact, it, it was uh, remarkable how quickly the, the virus was sequenced and, and, um, uh, and of course, the lockdown in Wuhan in China proved, demonstrated uh, that COVID could be eliminated. Uh, and yet um, a very different policy was pursued in, in virtually every country um, outside of China, uh, the, the uh, homicidal policy of herd immunity. And... I think this, you know, raises, of course, the 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 connection between between the two books we're discussing. I mean, Comrade North remarked, um, you know, the 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 real question uh, is, unless there is a socialist revolution, this planet is doomed, uh, and this is raised uh, just as much by the pandemic uh, as it is by uh, the uh, growing threat of nuclear war. 
Um, but I wonder, Evan, if, if you would like to uh, elaborate on the question that Craig has has raised about uh, what what are the financial interests uh, that are served by by this policy of um, herd immunity, uh, and particularly by the mass deaths among disabled elderly people um, who have who are most at risk. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a very important question, um, and I would just say initially we I think we as part of the inquest we have to really uh, develop uh, specific investigations into sort of this very topic and how it's um, been implemented, uh, you know, in specific countries here in Australia uh, and throughout the world. But but absolutely, this is uh, this has been really a, a central aim of the uh, the bourgeoisie throughout the world to lower life expectancy, to reduce pension costs, and you know, the pandemic was very much seized upon by uh, the most right wing forces in society. Uh, to implement this policy, as as we've said earlier, this uh, the strategy of herd immunity was pioneered in in Sweden. Uh, and there's actually there's explicit statements which we've documented um, in uh, uh, testimony from Keith Begg, who's a, an anti-COVID activist, uh, where uh, Johan Geisica, uh, Anders Tegnell were explicitly advocating for the spread of the virus. Uh, and uh, there's you know a quote um, actually it was from there's another uh, health official in Britain, which then copied this uh, this policy, who explicitly said that the aim was to reduce pension costs, or that this would be a positive, uh, uh, you know, effect of this policy. Um, so this, yes, that's a, it's absolutely been been central to the, or what you know, it, yes, it's been central to the policy of of herd immunity, um, and you know, I think really we've seen throughout the pandemic this, uh, you know, this. Uh, Sort of a revival of uh, eugenicist conceptions, uh, the Nazi conception of life unworthy of life, um, and you know this uh, this really um, you know the the basically the the creating of conditions to uh, to call the elderly to um, to kill disabled people. Uh, you know I think there that yes this is it's a you know it's a very um, it's a very conscious policy. Uh, which we have to, you know, as I said, we have to really expose how this is being um, implemented in each country. Uh, in the United States, one of the key figures who has uh, advocated this is, uh, and, or advocated lowering life expectancy is a man named uh, Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, who's the brother of uh, Rahm Emanuel, who was uh, Obama's uh, chief of staff, I believe, during his first term. Uh, and Rahm Emanuel is famous for saying, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, which he said in response to the 2008 financial crisis, on uh, which the ruling, which the ruling class used to uh, rip up uh, social spending, uh, to funnel uh, massive amounts of money to the uh, to the rich, and that same strategy, uh, you know, underlied their approach to the pandemic. Um, this book documents, I think, really one of the critical elements of this book is the uh, documentation of what took place, uh, really, from late February uh, to May 2020 uh, in particular, this was, uh, you know, all of the, in the US uh, and internationally, this was the period when um, limited lockdowns were implemented and then very rapidly in many countries, uh, very rapidly uh, reversed. And um, the, uh, in the US, the, the mantra uh, for this campaign was uh, coined by uh, New York Times columnist, uh, Thomas Friedman, who said, uh, the cure cannot be worse than the disease. And by that, he meant that the financial uh, interests of the, the ruling class, uh, the economic imperative, uh, the need to produce profits uh, could, not be, um, could not be impinged upon uh, regardless of how many lives were lost, how many millions of people were infected and, and killed. And uh, Trump uh, seized upon this and used, you know, promoted this uh, this concept as part of the homicidal uh, back to work campaign, which was um, began immediately after the the passage of the the CARES Act. Um, so I don't know if Dave, you want to add anything. There's a lot that that could be said on this. But um, yes, I, I, I just I think it's uh, really critical to understanding the pandemic. And we have to develop our analysis of this. I mean, thank you for those uh, important questions and uh, and answers. There is um, a question to Comrade Dave, who 
um, from Daniel, who asks, uh, how can we combat apathy and cynicism in our fellow working class who believe themselves as individuals and as a whole powerless against the crushing mechanisms of global capitalism? The mood I find in my experience among, among people is that we have no control over history, current events and the future. This is incorrect, but how do you best inspire people to take up the cause? Well, there are two factors at work, uh, fundamentally. First of all, the driving force of social revolution is objective. Uh, Trotsky's, uh, the captain of Trotsky's guard in Kiowa Khan, Harold Robbins, whom I was privileged to know, uh, remarked to me that uh, in a discussion which Trotsky had with his guards where they were discussing precisely this question, Trotsky said, you know, everyone responds differently to an argument, but everyone responds the same way to a red hot poker. And you can look at any time in history, <clears throat> uh, and Trotsky stressed this point in uh, the opening of history, uh, his monumental, brilliant history of the Russian Revolution. He made the point that revolutions don't take place because human thought is so revolutionary. Actually, he said it's very conservative. Social consciousness lags far behind social being. The great objective forces which set masses of people into historical action develop, so to speak, behind their backs. You might say that the last indicator of a revolutionary crisis is a sudden eruption of a mass movement. Uh, in the formation of in the, uh, the origins of historical materialism, uh, you might say of a scientific approach to history out of, of, which, of which Marxism became the highest expression, uh, was the French Revolution. <clears throat> its eruption in 1789 and its development seemed to pursue a logic of its own. Th there was this thing called the revolution, uh, which took its twist and turns from day to day, its ups and downs. No one knew what this thing would do on any given day, but what was this revolution? Continuous and violent eruptions of masses of people, often unexpectedly, at a point even when within the revolution, reaction seemed triumphant. And it was really the attempt in a sense to understand what this event was, how it took place. Uh, from which or was one of the uh, central political or historical driving forces of uh, an understanding that history is an objective process. Of course, there is confusion. There is, compared to the scale of the crisis, uh, consciousness lags far behind. But there is this sort of molecular process, a growing awareness of that things are becoming impossible. What we're describing, whether when we talk about the um, pandemic, this is a great social shock. The books which we have produced, the articles, uh, have sought to make this comprehensible and conscious. We, as a historical entity, the ICFI is the most conscious actor in the historical process, but we didn't fall from the sky. You know, we exist and we are ourselves an expression, but at a very conscious level of a historical process. Now, what is going to change the moods of discouragement, the, the overused word of demoralization? Well, Trotsky said it very simply. He said all these moods were created by events, and they'll be changed by events. People are driven into struggle. 
Marx once said it very well, talking about different class reactions in a period of crisis, the middle class becomes nervous, the working class gets angry. And it's true. <clears throat> Masses of workers, once they enter into struggle, become ever more conscious of themselves as a historical force. Objective conditions of working class life incline workers toward a more collectivist view. They work together, they rely on collaboration. The middle class, middle class elements approach things differently. But nevertheless, this process is taking place. I, I must say, you know, we don't worry very much about whether or not there's going to be a revolutionary movement. We know there will, that will happen. It's happened in the past. It will happen again. Why should our epoch be so different? It may appear that the challenges are very great, but they were always very great. You know, before, Marx grew up in, when he, his childhood was spent in the age of Metternich. The quadruple, whatever they call it, alliance of reactionary forces, all arrayed against revolution. But the revolution happened because changes were taking place in the structure of society that gave rise to the explosions of 1848. Then came another period of reaction, out of which 1871 emerged. The suppression of the com commune over a long period then gave rise to a resurgence of the new working class based on the emergence of what was modern industry, the industrial proletariat, mass socialist movements. Now there is a historical process. Now we don't, we know that is at work and we study it. We are particularly struck by the global character of the productive process. Transnational production is a great objective force in the bringing together of workers all over the world. And we are introducing in our own intervention this understanding. For example, we're involved in a strike of Clarios workers who produce batteries. We now know, of course, that uh, electro electronic vehicles is the wave of the future. This will become an essential part of production with vast implications. We are doing our best and with success to introduce into the struggle of these workers at Clarios a greater awareness of the international dimensions of their fight. The ICFI has been working on that since really the 18, 1980s, and it's being verified. We said 35 years ago that in the next great wave of working class struggles, the workers will tend to consciously identify themselves as an international class. Now, so we know that. You know, that is a scientific element of our analysis. But we also know that revolutions are not a purely objective process. They're carried through by people. And revolutions, while producing great changes in consciousness, also require that consciousness is not one of pure militancy. It must be politically directed. And so the development of a leadership of a conscious section of the working class, drawing the most advanced elements forward, is a critical element in the victory of the socialist revolution. We've had discussions in Australia about this issue, and I've uh, recently came across a quotation which I thought is enormously important, uh, where Trotsky is speaking at the Dewey Commission of 1937, answering you know, the case of the Stalinists which they had put forward, such as it were, at the Moscow trials. And he was asked, well, is it true that uh, the Fourth International, the Trotskyist movement, uh, is for war because you believe that war leads to revolution? And he said, well, that's a totally absurd falsification of our attitude. Yes, wars do lead to revolutions. But wars don't necessarily lead to successful revolutions. The success of a revolution depends upon the existence of a working class leadership, a Marxist party. 
Without that, neither wars nor revolutions bring anything good. The peculiar character of revolutions in our epoch is that they require a great understanding of the historical process by the workers of the very struggle in which they are engaged. So that is the really the decisive issue here. Yes, the, the, to, to quote, I mean, the situation in revolutionary periods are always difficult. Lincoln, a great bourgeois revolution, revolutionary, said in his famous State of the Union, I believe in 1862, he said, the occasion is piled high with difficulties. As our case is new, so we must think anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. And, they said, and so we will save our union. Yeah. We have to rise with the occasion. It always, revolutionary situations present themselves always in the most existential terms. It's really all or nothing. Yeah. That's what we have to understand. And I think uh, we can see that the processes through which we're passing have the potential for staggering advance or catastrophic failure and disaster. We have reached the point of um, now every the, the new thing everyone's talking about is AI, artificial intelligence. There is no doubt that this is a extraordinary advance in technology which can have if utilized correctly and developed correctly with the help of ai itself vast implications we also know that it can have catastrophic consequences yes it can lead to the loss of employment for countless millions and millions of people, including, by the way, in the tech industries. There are many things which are now, which require direct human labor, which will be done semi-automatically. And if this technology remains in the hands of the ruling elites, utilized only for their own enrichment, the results will be disastrous. You know, and they'll apply AI to figuring out how best to send off nuclear weapons to annihilate their opponents, or how to create biological weapons which can be targeted to certain genetic models. I mean, this is the crazy things these people are working on. So this technology must be seized by the working class. In fact, we must use this technology in the interest of developing the revolutionary movement, in the development of revolutionary strategy and tactics. So that's how the issues pose themselves today. So I just want to say, there is an objective process. Don't second guess history. It's creating a revolution. We're living in revolutionary times. But the particular challenge is to build a movement that wins the working class and its most advanced elements and among the youth, among intellectuals, among the most far-sighted elements in uh, among artists. Uh, I mean, just want to make the point. I mean, that you know, doctors and scientists who have gone through this experience are horrified by what they're seeing, and I know we're. Our writings are being very widely followed. I would urge the uh, scientists and doctors who are following this or to uh, turn their eyes and their consciousness toward the working class. That's the force that you need to mobilize. You can't do it by yourselves. You can only do it uh, in affiliation with uh, the revolutionary movement. And I think we've proven, we've proven that.